Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I am happy to be joined by Cushing Academy's coach, James Cormier. Now, James, his dad was a Division I head coach, coaching the NBA, um, big-time basketball personality up in the college basketball and NBA world. And James, actually himself, left public school to go to a prep school, right? Went to Proctor Academy before playing at LeMoyne and then got into coaching. Coached at Northfield Mount Hermon, coached in the Ivy League at Dartmouth, and he's been at Cushing Academy uh, the past six years. So in this conversation, we talk a lot about you know what they do for development, the benefits of him working as an admission officer in the admission office. Um, the question asked every coach is what it takes for a guard to play at the D1 level. We also talk about you know, timing for recruiting and how important the June scholastic period is for prep schools, you know, how he works in July, getting in shape in August, open gyms, and then committing before October or waiting throughout the season and committing late in the year after the transfer portal has kind of settled down. So we get into it a lot today. Um, you learn a lot about Cushing Academy, a lot about James's philosophy, and I think it's a great episode. So thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. James, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Corey. Looking forward to it. Yeah, you went to a prep school growing up yourself, and tell me about what the decision-making process was for going to prep school, and then how you ultimately chose the prep school you went to. Um, yeah, so I went to Proctor Academy. I played for the legendary Gregor McKechnie, who's now the AD. Uh, my former teammate, Ben Bartoldis, took over as the head coach there, great guy, um, and an, an up-and-coming program. I think Ben's going to do a great job rebuilding that that program. Um, the process for me was I always identified as an athlete. So I played football, baseball, and basketball, uh, wasn't the best student, to be honest. I had three older brothers that all went the public school route. My dad at the time was the head coach at, I'm sorry, my dad was in the NBA, former head coach at Fairfield university, um, and other places as well, but he knew all about the recruiting process, the benefits of prep school, you know, the pros and cons of living away from home um, and the pros and cons of, you know, attending a, a local public school. And he thought, you know, the balance of prep school would be, would be beneficial. Um, I was intrigued by the development, the exposure that it brought in those three sports, particularly basketball. I didn't know what I wanted to play at the collegiate level, but I knew if I wanted a chance to play at the highest level, I probably needed to make a sacrifice socially um, and step it up academically, which is um, exactly what Proctor was able to do for me, provide that balance and structure necessary to succeed as a student athlete. Um, and as a kid who you know enjoyed his friends and liked meeting people from all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. Prep schools offer that, as we both know, but you picked Proctor. Was it because of the coach? Was it the price? What are the schools were you looking at? Like, what were some of the factors that helped you decide? Yep. Um, mm, several reasons. I think um, price, uh, I played multiple sports, so I think I was an attractive, you know, student athlete in that sense and maybe got a little extra financial aid um, having that, those experiences and, and background. Um, I love Gregor, just a really, really genuine person, really cares about his play, cared about his players and still does. Um, I'm in, in touch with him to this day. I actually just got back from a golf trip in Oregon with one of my my uh, prep school teammates from England, Matt Williams, who ended up going and playing collegiate football at Cal Berkeley. So, um, yeah, I, I would say Gregor was a component. Um, we had ties to New Hampshire so I had some f friends and family up north in in New Hampshire in the um in the Upper Valley area because my dad was at Dartmouth when I, I was actually born in Hanover. So all those things uh, the familiarity, the price, the coach, all three sports were pretty competitive, um, nice facilities, you know, good again, good balance of academic, social life and um and athletics. Did you go for a postgrad year or for multiple years? 
I went for two. I did a junior and senior year. And again, that was more of the academic side. I would have loved to finish up all four years at my public school, graduate with the kids I grew up with. But I think, uh, again, getting adjusted um, and, and having that two-year experience was, was beneficial for me. And now being a prep school coach, I mean, is that part of your um, part of your advantage talking to families is actually being in the shoes they've been in? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, just being able to speak on it. And you don't, you know, as I recruit as the coach, especially post-grads, you know, they all want the basketball. Well, what's development like? And I keep telling them, trust me, you're going to get more basketball than – that then you know you're you're going to be ready for but you're going to graduate from here you know in early june late may and look back at your your one year two year three year experience and think back to this recruiting conversation and say man i really did learn a lot about how to advocate for myself how to be gain independence live on my own you know all those things that are going to be so crucial as you make the transition to college um college life not college basketball but college life you know you're you're just going to be more well much better equipped than you know your peers that that didn't have that boarding experience um yeah so yeah absolutely now let's go back to time development time right because you know one thing that these pop-up basketball academies always profess is hey you can be in the gym 10 hours a day and because there's no academic component or other components. And I know some certain prep schools have more gym time than others. But my thought's always been, if you go game speed and do a 30-minute game speed workout, you're going to be gassed. Walk me through your thoughts, James, on like time in the gym and whether that matters or not. Yeah. I mean, you know, with the resources we have, social media, YouTube, coaching tools, we're all doing similar things. I think it's just the... The way we explain things, um, understanding different personalities. Um, you know, I, I work with 14 year olds and I have 20 year olds. Mm -hmm. So there's a wide range and there's a maturity level um, and just a certain understanding of how to process things that as a prep school coach is, is a challenge and, and something that I'm going to continue to develop um, an, an area I'm going to continue to develop in. Um, but to your point, it's really about maximizing the time that we spend in the gym. 10 hours a day is, is not healthy for anyone in the gym. Um, you know, we offer workouts 6.30 in the morning, um, five days a week, Monday through Friday. And I'll probably be there three or four days of the week. And my assistants cover, you know, we overlap at times, but they cover the other days. And honestly, like this time of the year, it's it's all voluntary. And it's, we don't keep receipts. Um you know, if you want to be there, we're there. And we want to work with, with the guys that, um, you know, find the, the, uh, the extra morning workouts um, impactful to their, to their development. And then, you know, we, we want to structure their day so that there's elements of strength conditioning and they're doing the right things in that sense. Um, you know, obviously there's mandatory study hall at most of these, these boarding schools. So Monday through, or Sunday through Thursday, we don't have Saturday classes at Cushing, um, but they're in studying eight to 10. So, um, and we also want to let them be kids again, you know, part of the experience is meeting people from all over the world and, you know, finding maybe a, a new interest in the arts or, um, you know, just being able to, to, again, enjoy some clubs or some extracurricular activities that, that the school has to offer. Absolutely. And just letting everyone know listening right now, we're recording this in the middle of May, right? So keep that in context when James talks about, you know, kids getting in the gym right now. But let's go back to when the school year starts. So obviously you've got your regimented, uh, you know, practices, your open gyms, your morning workouts. But, you know, do you have opportunities for kids to get in the gym like before lunch if they want to or or if they got a free hour or they get in the weight room? Like talk to me about how Cushing uh, gives kids the freedom to get extra, you know, weight room, weight room reps in or shots up. Yeah, I mean, that's our cell. And, and that's what I enjoy most. I mean, I didn't necessarily know if I was going to go the training road. I had a training service before I was an assistant at Dartmouth. Um, and I worked with 10 year olds all the way up until NBA guys. Um, and I really enjoy that aspect. You know, the, the camaraderie and the team element and the family kind of, you know, connection that it that a 
a coach is able to experience um, leading a team is what I felt I would miss. So that's why ultimately I chose to go um, in this direction. But the player development at Cushing, like I work in admissions, so I have some flexibility. I don't have like a set class schedule. So if I'm not doing interviews or in meetings or doing, you know, miscellaneous tasks for the admission office, I'm pretty much going to be down at the gym. Um, and they do restrict us to three, three student athletes in a workout. Um, but, you know, we have the gun and we have an, two full-time assistants, as well as my dad that works. He's again, a former division one coach and uh, former NBA coach as well. So he's around in the fall and in, in the winter season. So he's always available. So pretty much we, we're never going to turn a kid away from the gym and, you know, those, those individual workouts or those small group workouts, you're, you're really three on one with a coach and you're getting a lot of attention. And we we're pretty mindful about getting, you know, wings in with wings, or if we want to do some pick and roll breakdown, we might have two bigs and a guard and um, explaining the short roll and, you know, different ways we're going to play out of the, the low block and high, high post pinch post, things like that. Um, so really just trying to, in those smaller group workouts, not just work on skill development, which is of course an emphasis, but something we feel you can work as long as we give you the drills, you're able to work on that stuff on your own a bit. We want to be more intentional about like, you know, concepts and uh, read and react, um, you know, type experiences when the coaches are there to work um, again with, with the student athlete. I love that. That's exactly the kind of reads and stuff that kids probably aren't getting at their normal high schools, which you with your college experience can bring to that. And, you know, I was going to get into this later, but let's get into it now. You mentioned your father helping you out coaching. Explain his role and what a benefit it is to have his expertise on the bench with you. Yeah, my father's been great. I mean, a lot of people are, you know, ask that question and then they follow up. Is he overbearing? Like, what, what's he like? Is, you know, is, and, at times, you know, sure, but he's very, he doesn't have an ego. You know, one thing about him is he, he's got a ton of humility. So if I'm like that, enough, you know, just kind of shut him down real quick. He's receptive. He gets it. He knows it's, you know, it's, it, I don't like to look at it or even say it's my program, but, you know, I am the head coach and um, he certainly respects that. Um, and, but he's certainly not going to back down. He's going to say what's on his mind and take it or leave it. This is how I feel. And I do have great experience. So, this is, uh, again, my input, but he doesn't have an ego or, um, you know, he, he, he doesn't tell mom when I don't run the plays that, you know, he'd like to be running. So it's, it's been, I mean, it's been a blessing. I worked with him at Dartmouth for two years. It's one of the coolest parts about my whole basketball resume and career, just being able to, you know, work side by side with, with my pops. Yeah. And I work with uh, my father too, James, and it's just uh, in both my, my companies and it's just great. It's great to get that bond with him. Back to your days at Proctor, you ended up choosing to play at LeMoyne. Walk me through why you picked LeMoyne and who you chose them over and just, just kind of, because kids are always now trying to figure out which school to pick. Walk me through your decision process for your college. Yeah. Um, well, I did have opportunities to go play Division One. I. Um, I had Stony Brook in Maine, and then um, actually both staffs got fired. Um, and I was offered by them later in the process. I think Stonehill offered me a three for four. I went and visited St. A's. Um, the reason I didn't go Division One is because the staffs got fired, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. And my dad, it wasn't about going Division One for me. It was about getting a full scholarship and playing at a high level. Um, I love to play. So, you know, I started my first game at LeMoyne and mm. pretty much all the way through my college career. Um, and my dad was a great advisor in this process. Like James, you got offered by these division one schools in late March. They got fired about two, three weeks later. You're probably not a division one player. Um, and again, that's just like how I was, how he grew up and how he raised me, like it is what it is. So I said, you know what? I, I met coach Evans at five star last summer. Um, I, I know he's a hard nosed coach that, you know, will help me become a better player and I'll have opportunities to play right away. They got great guys around me. So, um, you know, or sh shouldn't say great guys around me, but great guys to play with. Um, 
and it was a great experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Again, another, I was able to have a lot of fun at Lemoyne, great college town in Syracuse, great league, any 10, you see these any 10 schools and Lemoyne's actually the latest one going division one, which I'm sure you've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, what Joey Gallo has done with Merrimack, Chris Krause has done with Stonehill. Those teams are leaving division two and going to the NEC and they're winning the league or, you know, top three or four in Stonehill's case this year. So, um, great, great division two league. It was an awesome, awesome experience, but mostly, um, I chose Lemoyne. Uh, I wanted to be in a city. It was probably the best academic school that, so using basketball as a means, you know, to find a better academic opportunity was important for me and my family. Um, and then full scholarship. Yeah. Good breakdown there. Um, and then you got into coaching after that. One of your first jobs was at Northfield Mount Hermon under legendary coach John Carroll. What did you take away from John at your time at NMH? Yeah, John um, John is the best when it comes to culture, um, branding. You know, he makes it very clear when you first get there, whether you're his assistant coach. I remember him saying, you know, make sure there's no – I know you just graduated from college. Make sure there's no pictures, whether you're holding it or not, with, you know, an alcoholic beverage or – you know, any, any places that you shouldn't be. And I was kind of confused because it was so early in my professional career. I'm like, people would kind of understand, you know, this was two years Mm -hmm. ago in college, but you know, of course I followed suit. That was my boss. And um, I did what I was told. And uh, you know, our first meeting, he talked the same way to the kids, like, you know, you are your brand and what you say, who you associate yourself with, what you wear, that's, that's, you know, how you're going to be perceived, um, whether it's who you are or not. So just being mindful um, in everything we do about, you know, what our perception is and and how people view us and how it could benefit us or how it could, you know, hurt us. And, um, you know, again, I think just the buy-in that John has and the culture he created is something that I probably tried to take away most from that experience. Great basketball mind, um, of course, like probably as good as anyone in, in prep school, but I also have my dad in that sense and a lot of NBA experience. And I, I grew up, you know, at the kitchen table, eighth, ninth grade, moving the salt shakers and knives around as X's and O's. And I, I had a decent background there and John certainly helped, but I'd say the biggest takeaway was culture, branding, um, leadership, that type of thing. Love it. And then you went from NMH and then you did two years in the Ivy League at Dartmouth. I think that's yep. where we first met. So talk to me about um, what it was like being a D1 assistant. What's one of the big things you took away from being at that level? And on top of that, James, being in the Ivy League, like that people might not know about the Ivy League. Yeah, yeah. The Ivy League, the Ivy League's a different beast. Um, obviously, there's no, well, not obviously, but there's no athletic scholarships um, granted in the Ivy League. So it's a bit similar to recruiting here at prep school. I think right. That experience probably prepares um, coaches that want to transition to prep better than anywhere. The reason I say that is because, and the, the, this might be saying sharing too much, but it just it is, is what it is. So when you're targeting a family or when you're recruiting a family and you start to get to know them and in the Ivy League, you do discuss finances because obviously, again, there's no athletic scholarship. So if the family says no issue, you know, we do well, we're fortunate to be able to send our kid wherever and we're happy to pay, you know, the price of admission. Great. We can continue building this relationship. Let's pursue this family. Then there's a family that says, you know what, this is life changing. This would be first generation, um, you know, from our family to attend a school. Uh, We don't have very much money. You know, only one of us is working. So, you know, we're under X amount of money, maybe under $75,000 as combined family income, but we're really interested in Dartmouth or the Ivy League. Great. Let's pursue them because they're we are going to be able to support that financial aid package as Dartmouth admission, similar to Cushing. Then if you get in this spot where it's like, yeah, we're hearing from some Patriot and some NEC and some Mac schools. You know, Ivy League sounds amazing. We understand the doors that it opens up later on in life, but I can't, I don't know if I can get myself to pay thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year when I have a free education, you know, going to a Holy Cross, Bucknell, Sacred Heart, 
you know, that type of school. Um, and I get that. So I try and target, you know, so I don't waste their time, our yeah. time as a staff, try and target maybe lower income that are going to, we're going to be able to support that family from a admissions perspective or, you know, a high end family in terms of finances. Um, Cause we know that they'll be able to make the sac financial sacrifices and pay the full tuition. That's same as prep school, the full pay are easy. The kids that qualify and in full need are easy. It's that, that middle ground there, James, where you got to find schools that are need based or merit based and see who needs what position and how interesting the kid is. So yeah, I guess working at Dartmouth really would have helped you for Cushing. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. For sure. Now here's a theory I heard. You tell me if this makes sense or not, especially being at the Ivy league. I've heard from previous coaches, you know, hey, go to the Patriot League for free, right? Kick ass academically, play, and then get your master's at an Ivy League in the career field you want to be in. And then you're going to be learning stuff specifically for your career field, being around peers that will be in that career field. And you still get the benefit of just paying for a master's degree versus a bachelor's. What are your thoughts on that? I love that. I love that. Um you know, but is it going to land with the kid who's, you know, concerned about it? I mean, I think it's great, but to st start talking about masters as a 12th grader, it might resonate with the f parents more so, but it's like, oh, great. I got, now I got to commit to two extra years of school or right, right. what the major is, four extra years <clears throat> of school. So yeah, that could work with a certain family and a, cer a certain makeup, but um, and it makes a lot of sense. It really does. I mean, I, I like the sound of that. Um, I've never heard that because I was on the other side trying to recruit uh, for the Ivy League kids away from the Patriot League in that scholarship situation. But um, it does make it does make sense. I had another family uh, who their kid wanted to go Ivy bad and he had he had Patriot offers and the family said, look, you go Patriot with a scholarship, we'll give you 15 K a year, you know, and that was cheaper for them than paying whatever the 50, 60 K the kid yeah. got extra cash. It's like, it's like original NIL deals. Right. <laughs> I love um, it. But I love the creativity that some families and coaches can come up with. Right. Yep. Um, you see it all the time. And now with the Ivy and the NILs, I, and we're not going to discuss that on, on this podcast, but I think there's so much potential there uh, of getting really creative. So mm -hmm. you're Cushing now you've been there. What this is your sixth year. My sixth season, seventh year. Yep. All right. Give me your pitch. COVID. You just, okay. Before COVID. So give me your pitch. I'm looking at prep schools. Uh, I'm on a phone call with you. Why should a kid come to Cushing? And so tell me the why, and then tell me a little bit about your school. Well, um, academically, Cushing is going to meet students where they're at. So we have students this year going to Brown, Michigan, hope potentially Air Force, um, so some high end student, you know, WPI last year, we sent a kid to um, Cornell uh, or two years ago, we sent a kid to Cornell, Middlebury. So high, high end students. We also have some students that, you know, aren't necessarily going to qualify for those higher end schools. Um, it might need a little bit more academic support and we can cater to those students as well. Um, we just set them up in different classes um, and we have an academic support program that's very robust. My assistant, uh, Fabian Lara, does a great job um, working in that in that space. So um, we have an ally and a good resource there. Um, in terms of social life, so there's not a dress code. Like this is a comfortable place. It's a safe place to go to school. Um, you know, true diversity, um, true geographical diversity. We have 30 plus states represented 30 plus countries represented um you know so you truly are meeting people from all over the world 93 percent boarding i think is important especially if you're an out of region kid which i i wouldn't say i necessarily prefer but i definitely value um i like getting kids from all over and just having different perspectives whether it be different countries or just different regions of the country um it's nice to kind of bring people together through basketball and, you know, our, our community here at Cushing, uh, from a basketball perspective, the sell is player development, as I mentioned, 
I live in the gym. Uh, my assistant coach, Laura, he has division one, you know, coaching aspirations. He lives in the gym. My father, he's 70 plus. You'd never know it. He's there all the time. And then I have an assistant from Cameroon who works exclusive, not exclusively, but specifically with our bigs. Um, he's six, 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 seven strong, just great footwork detailed in that area. Um, so we got a really nice team. Um, we do a ton of video stuff, both in mm. the off season, um, my network, having coached at the division one level, you know, being around division one coaches growing up, NBA coaches growing up. I think the name holds weight, you know, last name Cormier in the uh, basketball community. So, you know, when we get on the phone with someone, um, you know, they, they know we're, we're the real deal. Um, so I guess all those things combined again. So, you know, a comfortable place to go to school. Um, you know, you're going to enjoy meeting people, just regular kids. Uh, secondly, the academics could be very rigorous or, you know, for a postgrad, it's nice to be able to maybe take two elective courses, you know, an English course that you need in order to get into a certain program at a certain school, a math that, you know, might not be as difficult as the calculus or, you know, multivariable that you, you might be on track to take um, so that you can spend more time focusing on those individual workouts, both in the morning, throughout the day, and then our, our strength conditioning program. And I'm talking more about the fall, um, which is from four o'clock to five fifteen every day. Yeah, and to boot, you got a beautiful campus and beautiful gym too, which doesn't hurt. Uh, facilities through the roof, and in this place, I mean, in terms of res life, it's I would put this. Uh, you know, I'm happy to say this with full confidence. The dorms here are better than any dorms in New England. That's high praise. <laughs> I'm still. I'll stand by it. Okay. Hey, we're going to play a fun little game. I play with prep school coaches called guess and tell me if you know who the alumni is from Cushing Academy. All right. So I went to Wikipedia and you've got some heavy hitters on there. I'm not going to go with some hockey player from 1960s. I'm going to do some heavy hitters here. So you tell me if you've heard of this person. Okay. First one, John Cena. Oh yeah. <laughs> Does he ever John come back Cena. to the school or do anything with Cushing? Yeah, he gave the, um, he gave the commencement speech the year before I got here, 2016. Um, and we've done some marketing campaigns with John Cena as well of late. Our new head of school, uh, Dr. Randy Burton's terrific, and um, he's connected with him. I think last year he went out to California and spent some, or maybe Florida, and spent some time with him. And there's there's definitely something brewing, um, whether it be this June for alumni or you know in the works moving forward. Cool. Okay. That's probably the most recognizable name here, but next up, Betty Davis. Yep. Classic actress. Um, I want to say she was here in the forties, thirties or forties. Yeah. Old yeah, days. 42. I don't know, but yes. Um, yeah. Pioneer in the act acting space. Um, there's, uh, a tree on campus called the kissing tree. And there's all types of stories as to how that name came to be. Um, one of them is that's where uh, Betty Davis had her first kiss. So that's great know. lore. Yeah. If there's any truth to that, I'm sure that's an admission office uh, <laughs> story that we came up with at some point, but I love it. All right. Last one, Paul Thomas Anderson. Paul Thomas Anderson. He went to multiple high schools. He, I don't know how long he was at Cushing, but he had a short stint at Cushing. And he's the director of Boogie Nights, Magnolia, Licorice Pizza, The Master. Wow. Okay, okay. One of the top directors in the world. So I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And ironically, our visual arts program is one of the best in New England. Uh, we had a director that was here for over 50 years who headed that program. And just um, he's done an amazing job and and. The new director, Miss Esh, has has who's also a dorm head and takes care of a bunch of my guys, but she's a sweetheart and, and awesome in that space. But that's kind of what we're known for of late. Uh, performing arts is excellent as well, but it's amazing how many like actors and actresses have come through the ranks. Um, there's another one that's slipping my mind right now, but he's on like uh, he has his own show. I'll text you on the side. Okay. Any other alumni we should know about from Cushing you think uh, 
belongs in that list? Um, well, my guy, David Duke Jr., he's one of my most, I mean, he's just a special, special person, man. And that, that's what I'd like to say about all my kids. And, you know, we, we try very aggressively to recruit families and student athletes and not just solely go off like an AAU um, program um, because you don't get the whole picture, you know, when you recruit families, um, you know, and that's why I like working with you because, you know, you kind of lay, lay out who we're working with and who they are. And then you say, Hey, here's the family and you guys go and connect and see if it's a fit um, rather than maybe someone else telling me what this yeah. kid is, what he's going to be like on campus. I kind of got to do that research on my own and, and figure out if it's going to be a fit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, hey, that was playing uh, prep school alumni. You 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 won. You were two out of three. And, uh, you know, you got another actor there. You're going to let me know later. We'll put in the show notes. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so good job. That was this, this week's edition of Prep School Alumni featuring Cushing Academy. I had love um, James, you work in the admission office. What's the benefit of being in that position? And, and let me just share real quick. I love working with coaches that work in admission departments like you, Jay Tilton at Exeter used to. Ben Farmer at Williston um, and some others, because you guys know on a daily basis, like how many beds are available in each class, the amount of financial aid left. And there's just no disconnect between the coaching staff and the admission department, which you see in a lot of places, because sometimes an offer will come out and the coach has no idea what it is. Um, so share with me what the advantages are with you being in that office. Yeah. Being at the ground level, I think in exactly what you said, knowing how many beds are left, um, knowing, you know, what type of financial aid we can allocate to, you know, a certain family, um, the day-to-day -day conversations, nothing gets lost, you know, in, in two or three days, oh, I didn't have a chance to talk to him. And now all of a sudden the bed was, is filled. Um, yep. hold on one second, got a crying baby alert. <laughs> James is muted right now, but he and I are both the father of young kids. So uh, give us some grace on this one. Um, so, yes. Oh, yeah. So admissions. Yes. Um, that flexibility that I mentioned, being able to, you know, during the winter, it's tough, but it's also we also have practice every day. We have film sessions, you know, three, four days a week. So they get. And, and it's just a t exhausting season. You know, we might have three, four mm -hmm. games in a week, a lot of travel, academics. It's cold this part of the country. Um, so, you know, that's probably the busiest time of my year, unfortunately, but also fortunately, because in the fall and in the spring, when they have more availability on their own to get in during those free blocks, I'm more available to, to get in with them um, and, and work them out um, during the day. And that's something that my admissions team has supported. And, you know, the administration here has done a, a really good job making sure that, you know, I still have the av um, availability and ability to, you know, be present for, for the student athletes that I'm bringing in. Yeah, that's so great. You got that flexibility, right? One, knowing what's going on, on a daily basis Two, being able to get out, more than maybe some coaches to help your kids. Such an advantage, James. Speaking of advantages, you know, you're in the NEPSAC AA. And we've talked plenty of times about AAA, AA, single A, independent. What are your thoughts on AA? And does it matter if a kid plays AA, AAA, single A? Is there an advantage of Cushing being in AA? Like walk people that don't know how the class system works on what you think are the pros and cons of class and which one you're playing in, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, we we pretty much play every AAA school um, annually. Um, they're very competitive. You know, AAA, Brewster, going to the NIBC, and South Kent potentially making a move. Um, unsure on that, so I don't want to be speaking out of turn there, but um, that will be a big-time hit for AAA. Um, I've argued the last couple years um, – that double A is more competitive and we don't have Brewster, um, but we have Bradford Christian, Cushing, Worcester, Wilbraham Munson's been a beast. Um, you know, like Lawrence has some really good young talent, Brimmer and Mays loaded McDuffie's got good, you know, a ton of division one prospects. 
Um, and I'm missing some and I shouldn't because the league is that good. But, um, but anyways, there's like 14, 15 teams, you know, 14 opponents to play against. I think there's 15 teams in the league now. And I feel that's more of a league. You know, when I first got here, I think there was five triple a teams, um, and making that jump to be, you know, one of six and play each other three, four times a year. It's competitive. It's great, but doesn't seem like much of a league to me. Um, and this, another reason is the travel's a beast getting mm. to Bridgeton's about a four hour drive. Brewster's three hours. South Kent is three and a half hours. You know, Vermont's probably the closest or no, I'm sorry. Northfield will be the closest about an hour. We play them anyway. Um, so I, I guess that was a big reason for not, you know, honestly, like if we're going to go up to Bridgeton to play, how many college coaches are going to make that trip? Probably nobody. But yeah. if we play Bridgeton at the NPSI in Rhode Island at Rick, how many college coaches will be there? 25, you know, in this in this environment, maybe probably less than four or five years ago. But that's probably where you're going to get your bang for your buck. So as long as you're playing a very competitive schedule, and I mean, I, I had a post at the end of the year, I couldn't have been more proud of this team, really, really good group of guys. Um, and that's what I, you know, that's what I tell my kids, we're going to play one of the hardest schedules in the country. And I'd, I'd say this year from the prep level, it's absolutely the hardest schedule in the country. Sunrise Christian, Putnam, Bradford Christian, and Worcester, I believe, were the final four teams. We lost this Sunrise Christian in triple overtime, first game of the or second game of the year. Um, we played Bradford Christian four times. So that's five games against the final four. Played Putnam twice, probably the only team to do that. That's seven. And then we played Worcester twice as well. So that's, you know, nine games against the top four teams in the country. Um, you know, we were able to beat Brewster this year, beat South Kent, beat Hargrave. So again, it's, you know, it's just putting yourself in a position to prepare these kids for college, one with the exposure element, two with development, and three, making sure they're they're up for the test and, you know, they're challenged throughout the season. Yeah, those nine games you mentioned, James, that's a murderer's row. <laughs> And Hargrave too. I mean, um, and just all these other, it's a murderer's rose. So like you were going to step into a college campus. If you're a kid who played at one of these programs and playing a schedule like you played, it, the transition is going to be way more seamless than coming Absolutely. out of a high school, living with mom and dad. And it just, it, it's what I, it's what I'm on my soapbox on and you are every day, but just like just hearing you say that is just, I know these teams now good they are. And like your kids are going to be so ready for college next year. Yeah, agreed. And thank you. That's, you know, that's our goal. And I think some of us at times, I think generally speaking, prep school coaches are in it for the right reason. Um, especially here in, in New England. I know those guys the best. So that's, I vouch for them in that sense. But, um, you know, we got to keep in mind that we are preparing them for college. We're not yeah. trying to have, you know, a 90% win record you know, we want to win. We're all competitive, but not going to sacrifice, um, you know, that competitive um, environment that we're trying to provide. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you mentioned uh, playing at the MPSI in front of college coaches, right? And how that number is going to be down because of COVID and because of the transfer portal. Talk to me about how your placement has been in the past three years to really include this year, because we're in May right now. Mm -hmm. I still have clients that are postgrads that haven't been placed yet and they're freaking out. The coaches are making as many calls as they can walk me through what you're seeing right now and what you're telling families. Yeah, we, um, there's probably one kid, although I love the guys at Akron and I just awesome, awesome people over at Akron. Um, but all of our kids are pretty much placed now. So Nate Bledsoe's going to WPI um Harrison Hockbird earned a preferred walk-on spot at Michigan Adrian Uche do you know is going to Brown um Jack Margupis is going to Albany Marvin Musimi Kamali the class president as well um he's going to Akron and Luke Smith 
Uh, Luke McKeldin is going to Santa Clara, 6'10", big, very talented. Um, and then the one kid that we have to place who actually started every game, I'm pretty sure, Luke Smith, um, would be the only one looking. The six that I mentioned first committed before um, October 1st, I would believe. So early in the process, before these schools started to kind of think about the transfer side of things. Um, Luke Smith, um, he just, he didn't have a great summer. He was, uh, didn't get started great in the fall. And I think was just putting too much pressure on himself. But by the end of the season, he might've been arguably our most important player. And it's frustrating as a coach, because you know, he's a year older, you know, he's playing against the best of the best every day in practice, but also, you know, the schedule I mentioned. And once you get to the new year, January 1st, college coaches, especially at the division one level, they've kind of put those high school recruiting lists to the side. And now they're focused on the kids that they recruited in years past that maybe aren't having a great year and they're getting in touch with their AAU coach and they're working those pipelines opposed to really focusing on on uh, high school kids. So I try, I'd like to have all my kids commit almost by the season in this, um, you know, new age recruiting environment with really the transfers and, you know, the COVID thing will slow down after the 2024 classes. I'm sure you, you know, um, but yeah, I, I guess we've been, we've gotten ahead of it. I think we've been smart, our staff advising kids and families to commit a little bit earlier in the process. Um, again, I think Marvin might've played himself into a higher level, but Akron is probably a perfect fit because of their staff and, you know, nice facilities, you know, good city, all that stuff. Um, and he's just a loyal guy. So he probably was going to go with the school that recruited him the earliest and, and the hardest anyway. Um, but he had a hell of a se heck of a season. And then, um, Luke Smith, I mean, he's now what's happening is the transfer portal sort of exhausted itself. And now they're circling back. So now my phone is, you know, ringing off the hook for them. And it's frustrating because it's like, it's hard to figure out, do you really want him? Or is it because you missed on the guys that you actually wanted to, you know, commit, designate your time and, and focus on? So we're trying to sort through that. And, you know, I've been explaining him my division two experience and every division two East coast, West coast down South is, is interested and has really kind of offered him. Um, but you know, the dream is for all these kids to play division one. And I, I think he's, he could go in and play for a division one school right now and be effective, but he doesn't have those college statistics or college film. And, you know, that's, that's just the nature of the, the industry at the moment. I want to touch back on what you said where you're going to try to push guys to sign before October, right? <clears throat> is that all based on open gym or is that mostly based on the AAU prior to open gym or is it both? Yeah, I think seal, <clears throat> I think getting in the June period is nice. I'm very, we're very lucky to have that because that's when I can get with the kids face to face and say, this isn't going to cut it moving forward. If you play like this all summer, you're not going to be going to the level that we discussed. It's a, more competitive than ever. So here's X, Y, and Z that you need to improve. Oftentimes it's like just physical shape. Like you need to have an unbelievable motor, unbelievable toughness, unbelievable competitive spirit. If you don't have those things, then the skill, the shot making, you know, the IQ, the defensive prowess, whatever, it, it really doesn't matter that much. Um, because they're not going to equate what you do on the floor to winning at a high level. Um, so that's what I try and make them aware of after and during that June scholastic period, heading into the live period for July. Um, funny, we say this, John and Carol and I used to run lab prep, leadership, academics, basketball. Um, and now more than ever, it's, it's needed. And I got to call him when, when we hop off this to, try and get that going again at some point, but, um, but yeah, getting back to that. So th yes. And then I'll make the calls. So during end of June, heading into that July live period, and it's moved up a little bit this year. So I, I got my work cut out for me that last week in June, I have to get coat, you know, eyes on these kids in July. And then when the interest is there, 
come the fall, you know, we get in, back in touch with them mid August and we send out our open gym schedule. And that's sort of, you know, the first week of September typically is like, you know, boot camp for us. We're getting in shape. We're getting acclimated to what the drills are we do before we start open gym. And then, you know, just how competitive you have to be and the right, you know, how you have to play in those open gym settings. It's not necessarily normal pickup. We're really trying to demonstrate that we know how to make that extra pass. We're going to compete, whether it's, you know, an open gym or whether it's the championship game, because that's the type of, you know, dogs is, a, is a, you know, the word that a lot of us are using these days that, that we're going to have in our program. Um, because again, that's conducive to winning at the next level. So yeah, so to, to in, in short, or to shorten up this answer, uh, September is the biggest month of open gym. For mm. sure. So that August period, you guys have to stay in shape. I know it's a grueling July travel, 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 you know, you're just getting off of school, public schools getting out late to mid June. So you don't have much time for rest. But it is what it is. You know, if you want to be great, and you want to play at that next level, you can't take August off and expect to be recruited in September. Um, so I guess that would be a message that I'd want everyone participating in the prep circuit to understand. Yeah, I tell my clients, you got to show up day one of prep school in the best shape of your life because your offer, your future college coach could be sitting at gym, the first open gym period, and you got to perform. But once you explain real quick, you mentioned the scholastic period in June. For those that don't know, James, talk about the advantage that it is for prep schools and what exactly that it is and what uh, and about the college coaches that attend. Give me a breakdown. Yeah, NEPSAC, NEPSAC, um, is I mean we just have a reputation there's been you know from my time playing in the NEPSAC to now I mean there's I mentioned the graduating class has six division one players on it from just from Cushing so you think about Worcester you know you think about Brewster you think about all these schools competing in two two or three days I guess it's Friday to Sunday afternoon all in one facility you're going to get a lot of college attention. Um, and again, I think that the past history of the NEPSAC um, demands that attention. And, and I've been to Peach Jam in the last couple of years. I mean, I was just in Atlanta at EYBL. There's a lot of coaches at those, those sneaker circuit events and, you know, AAU events throughout the summer and spring. But I, I don't know if there's any event more heavily attended than, than the NEPSAC. Oh, so really? Period. really interesting yep. interesting and then now let's go back to the fall again so they've done the scholastic period you've made made phone calls before july they're going through their drills in august september open gym comes in and they might get offers they're not that happy with so they might think well look i came here to play a full season against this competition to show myself i want to play out this season to see what kind of offers will land in my lap so that used to be the old way of thinking, right? Well, there was two camps, right? You get the ones that sign during open gym and then you get the guys that play through the season and then they sign at the end. But once again, I'm reiterating, you are still suggest. So is it bird in the hand or two in the bush, right? Like if a kid's got an offer, he's not so high on in October. How do you advise them? That? Yeah, I just lay it out for the family. And I just say, if you're comfortable dragging this process out until mid to late April, and even into May, potentially, let's do it. I'm down. I'll help you out. I'll see this thing through. But I want you to realize it might be the same offer and a lot of stress along the way. And the the original offer that was so excited and so supportive and, um, you know, j just recruiting you the, the appropriate and correct way um, might not feel the same way seven months from now. When you said when you put them off for six, seven months, say, oh, I'm looking division one or no, nah, I want a higher level division one or whatever your situation might be. Um, so I guess the big thing is advising the kids and the families how to speak to coaches, how to maintain that interest if they decide they want to play it out and um, and then just explain them just like I explained to you, like, listen, January 1st, don't call me saying who's calling me for offers. Nobody. No mm -hmm. one's calling about high school kids in January and February and even into March. They might start showing up to the national prep championship, but that's that's really it after the new year. 
Um, and then there's that, you know, they're inviting transfers up and trying to pursue that route. And then come, you know, early April, they might start calling me back. April, Mid-April, start bringing you up on visits. And then by early May, you know, maybe making commitments towards you and, and vice versa. It's so stressful. Have you seen uh, an uptick in your kids wanting to walk on D1? Um, in the recruiting process, I have seen that I've, I have one going to Michigan who was gung ho. He has family ties and, um, it's always been his dream to play at Michigan and could have maybe played low division one at the scholarship level potentially. And, and definitely would be like a D three all American type kid. Um, but he's the only one of late, but yes, through the recruiting process. And for one reason, either they didn't choose us or we didn't think it would be a fit. Um, I have seen a good amount of division one kids looking for that walk-on opportunity. Yeah. It's, I've seen it more and more because it's, it's, it's this, um, it's this thing that's still D one or bust even still in 2023. It's just that, I mean, I was a D one or bust kid, so I get it, but that was 1995 mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, now with the transfer portal and everything, it just, I, I just, I really try to dissuade everyone from walking on. I really do. Cause I just don't think they realize until they get there and see the realities of it. And each program treats their walk-ons a little bit differently. So I just think it's a huge risk to take James. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. yeah if you'd love to play, like I, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, I, I just wanted to play. I wanted to go and play 30 minutes a night. And that's why I, Lemoyne was a fit for me. You know, I wasn't going to continue hunting into April and May when I had a place where I could go play basketball for free, get a good education and, you know, actually play significant minutes early on. Yeah. And like you mentioned playing, I, two of my kids that went walk-ons from Kentucky, they both were 2000 point scores in high school. Kids like that can't sit the bench. They just can't. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So one went to Louisville, one went to St. Mary's in California. And it's just like, they were like, I'm better than these players. And they didn't understand the politics and everything behind it as well. Um, but certain kids got to play right? just like yeah. you. Um, last question here. And this is one I ask all coaches, what does it take for a guard to play at the D one level? Um, size and athleticism is something that unfortunately <laughs> doesn't oftentimes get overlooked. Um, competitive spirit, IQ, obviously skill level for a guard needs to be high, high level. So handle, you know, shot maker. Um, and obviously, you know, if you're six, four and you don't shoot it as well, you know, compared to the five ten kid, there's some give and take there, but like non-negotiables, you have to have a high IQ. You have to have resolve, you know, when, when stuff goes South, which it always will practice games, school you have to be a rock um and you know i i think from a skill perspective shot making is ideal because if teams don't have to come out and play you then you know even the quickest guards can't get in the paint and necessarily create um so uh, you know i think shot making is probably this the most important skill um, resolve, leadership, toughness are, are probably the, the intangibles that I personally value. Um, and then, you know, dimensions, height, physicality, ability to finish at the rim. Those are all bonuses. Okay, perfect. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we're going to finish with some quick hitters here. Okay. Who's the best player you've ever guarded in the game? Ooh. Any level. Hmm, that's a good question and not quick enough probably, but played against a lot of good players. Um, I mean, Iman Shumpert was really good. I mean, I played Mike Beasley in high school. Probably Mike Beasley. Mike yeah. Beasley. What's yeah. Mike doing nowadays? I don't know. I just saw him on something. It might have been an old reel um, on Instagram, but he was playing pickup somewhere and <laughs> – sharing life lessons, which, I don't know, it's pretty cool. Okay. Who's the best player you've ever coached against, both at the college level and then at Cushing? Um, another great question. Um, hmm. 
Like, did someone in Dharma just tear you up one game? Justin Sears at Yale was terrific. Um, I mean, that's just Ivy League, though. I'm trying to think, like, non-conference. Who did we play? Um, I guess I'll go with Justin Sears. Just keep it in the Ivy League. He was, I think, back-to-back -back player of the year while I was there. Just a beast. Just 6'8", workhorse. Just got it done every night. You couldn't really game plan for him. You know, did a little bit of everything. Um, I like Terrence Mann a lot. I loved his game. You know, I coached against Jordan Nawara. Didn't play particularly well against us, but he was a heck of a player. Um, oh, Filipowski, Kyle Filipowski. Loved mm -hmm. him from the moment I saw him. Like, always been a believer. Um, just great feel. Great demeanor, obviously all the physical attributes, 6'10", skilled, makes, you know, makes shots, finishes through contact, defends, competes, leads. Awesome. Kyle Filipowski, no, no doubt. Okay. What are your hobbies? I think golf, right? I love golf. I love to play golf. Um, I love, I love my kids, you know, my two kids. Um, I like, you know, I work out a lot. Um, got a great group of guys that I grew up with still on a group text with them, talk with them every single day. Um, so friends and families, um, you know, so important and just any experiences that I could share with them. Awesome. And last one, what's your favorite movie? Wow. I could probably go in a couple different directions. I love the departed. Oh, I can watch that anytime it comes on. Yeah, that's, again, probably the reason. If it's on, I'm watching it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good choice. Is there anything we didn't discuss today, James, that you want to mention before we go? Um, no, I mean, I guess the one thing I'd leave you with is people ask me all the time, do you think, you know, do you think prep school is for this kid? Do you think it's for that kid? I, I honestly... I've never heard of a family say my kid, you know, he's too mature for college, you know, like boys and specifically, but like getting the extra year to develop as a young man is so important and it could not always, but it, I don't see it ever as a disadvantage. Um, it's never really going to hurt a kid. All it's going to do is allow them to gain experience um, living on their own, you know, whether it be, doing laundry, having to go to the teacher themselves, wake themselves up, create a plan for the weekend where they can have some fun, do some studies and focus on, you know, the areas that they're most passionate about and want to continue to pursue. So I guess if you have the means or if you're fortunate enough, fortunate enough to get a scholarship um, and you're in limbo about, you know, I got a decent college situation, but this seems like a great prep opportunity. I would advise go ahead and pursue that that prep opportunity because you know ten years down the road I promise you your kid won't won't regret it. Yeah, love that. Where can people find you online, James? If they want to reach out um, to you. Yep, you can find me on social media at Coach J Corms and also uh, at Cushing Academy. Let's look that up so I get it right. We're going to put that in the show notes too, James, so people can click on that. Okay. No problem. So it's, um, yeah, Cushing B-Ball on Twitter and um, the same for Instagram as well. And yeah, I'm, uh, you know, our roster isn't set. We have uh, probably two spots available um, and we're open for inquiries. So let me know. Perfect. Well, James, thanks so much for joining the podcast. James Cormier, Head coach at Cushing Academy up in New England. Uh, top program. Great coach. Great pedigree. And uh, thanks so much for joining us in the podcast today. Thanks a ton, Corey. I appreciate it. You're welcome. If you guys like this, be sure to subscribe to us on all the major podcasting platforms. Also, YouTube. And any questions about prep school, feel free to reach out to me. You can find my information at prepathletics.com. Until next time, stay safe. And thanks for joining us. Take care.